The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We had a hard start there, and now we're right on live. <laughs> okay. Awesome. We are coming to you from Salem, New Hampshire, and we had one hell of a weekend. We were out in Hamburg, New York, teaching at the Barking Lot. We have our staff shirts on. Shout out to Noelle Nasca. At the Barking Lot. And her whole community over there. Yeah, if you don't know Noelle, you're clearly not that in tune with this podcast, because we did a four-part series with her and a daycare episode with her and everything else. But we just had a great time out there with her and her community teaching how to calm your canine. So we're going to talk about that whole program today and give you guys some tips and tricks with your own dogs and your anxiety. But first, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. Okay, my quirky tip is starting next week. So next week is what, November 1st? I don't know, I'm all over the place right now. No, uh, yes, it is. November 1st through the weekend before Christmas or the Wednesday before through Christmas, 1220 I'm doing quirky tips with awesome discount codes, with awesome products for holiday stuff, either two-legged presents or four-legged presents, but this is going to be, I know everyone doesn't celebrate Christmas, if you will, but theoretically, like, leading up to the holidays, if you need ideas for gifts, you want ideas for gifts for dogs, you know, gifts for friends' dogs, gifts for friends who love dogs, gifts for kids who only have dogs and no children, this is going to be for you. So every week, from next week until the Wednesday before Christmas, we're doing really cool shops with awesome discount codes only for our audience. So be sure to tune in and listen. All right, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Jimmy's yeah. having a TPLO next Thursday. I want to take a moment and acknowledge Bobby, the poor dog oh, from yes. Portugal. The oldest just dog just away, died. 31 years old. Yeah. And um, grew up on a farm, ate human food, and they said he got regular veterinary care. And uh, But 31, he was born in 1992. Yeah. So that's quite a run for a dog. Yeah. And I have... Renewed hope for my dogs. <laughs> you know, Jimmy is 11 and just starts acting like, well, you know, he's kind of in the sunset of his life now. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, he you know, just, this surgery, this surgery could give him three or four more good years. And Scott's like, three or four? We need like seven or eight. So whatever. He's going under yeah, just the knife. Offset the cost. Next Thursday, stop. He's going under the knife um, next Thursday, November 2nd. So send good vibes to him. We'll keep you guys posted. It's a three month recovery um, once he gets the metal plates put in. And He's healthy. He has a good heart and everything and else. But we have just been going through the throughs. He was out in New York with us and hobbling around in his harness. We call him, um, we were calling him Tiny Chew, but now Noel's called him Tiny Jim, which is kind of cute. It's even closer to Tiny Jim. So he's Tiny Jim. Um, but really what we want to talk about is this freaking program that we developed, that we spoke about, that we taught to a pretty sizable group. We had over 50 people there on Saturday. I took a tricks course or I taught a tricks course on Sunday, but we had a really, really good time and we had a lot of challenging dogs. I mean, we had a few working line German Shepherds. We had some Malinois, which are, you know, never an easy breed to go with. We had some challenging rescues. Um, so a lot of stuff came up and we talked through a lot of stuff and Scott and I so often feel like how to calm your canine is just so basic and everything else. But you know, we could have gone on and on and on and on and on. We had to like stop questioning. So we just want to talk about some of those things um, today. What did you get from takeaways? Where are you at with well, the whole I've, thing? Well, I've always thought, uh, you know, about this program and what we put together is it's incredibly simple, but it's not easy. Yeah. And it's easy to look at it and say, oh yeah, that's nothing or that's not a big deal. Do this, do that. But actually implementing these techniques and uh, finding out that you get some resistance from your dog or your dog is, you know, just doesn't want to be controlled or whatever is going on or, or the quite often the anxiety, you may not even notice that your dog has much anxiety yeah. other than maybe they, if you ask some pointed questions like, you know, does your dog get up and roam around the house when you're sleeping or is your dog always moving around the house during the day? When or you're always there? following you. Yeah, those kind of things. And, you know, those can be kind of telltale signs, but uh, quite often, it, the anxiety really will start to manifest when you stop allowing the dog to do whatever it wants to do because it's doing those things because it's not comfortable. So it it's keeps moving from room yeah. to room. Yeah. So when you stop the dog from being able to do that, whether it's putting the dog in a crate or simply putting it on a leash and keeping it w and not just pacifying it by constantly touching it, but just being there more neutral, the dogs will 
start to get more anxious. Yeah. Things will get a little worse before they get better. Yeah, no, completely. And we're not going to break down the whole program here today. Um, we do sell this online course. I think it's $37. It's very affordable. It's in a link in this description. Um, but there's also an accompanying ebook. And everybody that came this weekend now got the course to brainwash themselves with. And then the ebook also for follow up, trying to help really have these lessons sink in. But we break it up into <laughs> physical, behavioral, and emotional. And the physical stuff is just getting the dog physically controlled in some way, shape, or form. And we harp on this over and over and over again, but it is really important to recognize that a dog who's allowing his anxiety to control his movement, his fear to control his movement, you know, every which way you want to say it, that's not helping promote stability. You know, so physically being able to control a dog by whatever means possible, that often does sometimes involve a crate. We really like crating for anxiety is like the A number one go-to step. And that's really where a lot of dogs start to struggle with like, oh, I don't want to be staying in one place. I don't want to be confined in a crate. I don't want to be, you know, tethered to a door and not have the freedom to do what I want when I want. And you may see some protesting happening. So it's really important to be able to have ways to physically control your dogs. And that's why we talk about stepping on the leash, uh, you know, solid bed exercise. They're within the confines of a place board. Um, what's another one you do? Crating, obviously. That is physically confining a dog. Definitely, they can't get out. So it's Indeed. important to think about these things. People want to give their dogs more and more and more and more and more, but then sometimes their anxiety is bubbling up more and more and more and more and more because they have too many options. You know, people with anxiety, structure is good to have and limited options. If you have a hundred choices in front of you, that's going to um, raise your anxiety a lot more. So if you have like pick door number A or door number B, which one do you want to do? It's easier to see a picture that doesn't have as many options. Yeah. I mean the, the structured feeding, which seems simple to me because I always raised all my dogs like that, even, you know, before I, we even met. Um, but, you know, a lot of people I think are trying to heal their dog with food or make their dog feel better like an Italian grandmother. Uh, yeah. It's like everything is food. No yeah. matter what's going on, let's have something to eat, you know? Yeah. And uh, you wind up with a dog that's super picky. They don't want what you put down last night. They turn their nose up at everything and you start trying to make better and better meals. And the reality is they're just not hungry because they have access to food typically round the clock. I go to people's homes. I'll ask, how often do you feed? They'll say, once in the morning, once at night. I'll look at the bowl on the floor, it's three quarters full of food. Yeah. Because the dog doesn't eat breakfast. And yeah. then it grazes in the afternoon a bit. Then it doesn't eat dinner because it's not hungry. Because It's just like with the kids, you know? Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, if you don't have more than one dog, you know, resource guarding and stuff isn't going to pop up. So it's not the end of the world if there's food sitting out all day. But it is one of the really important things for behavioral stuff as far as anxiety goes, you guys. It does target anxiety getting on a structured feeding schedule. We talk about structured feeding in our free course, Canine Mind Shift. Structured feeding is important for so many different reasons, and that is a good starting place if you have a dog who's totally dysregulated, who's out of its mind with anxiety, maybe showing you know very serious separation anxiety, very serious fear issues, whatever you may have. Structured feeding is a good way to go. And if you have a little dog, you can do structured feeding three times a day. I get, you know, those small dogs sometimes. You don't want to have glucose issues and stuff and little Yorkies and everything else. But it should be three times. Okay, you get food. Here's five minutes. You get food. Here's five minutes. You get food. Here's five minutes. Teach the dog to eat on a schedule. Super, super important. Yeah, and a lot of, and when it goes to even doing some training with food, I mean, if your dog doesn't have at least good food drive, if yeah. not great, you're really, your hands are kind of tied as far as how much you can do. We had yeah. one person uh, raise their hand about the crating. There was a lot of questions about crating. I couldn't believe it. And talked about luring the dog into the crate, you know, the throw food into the crate. Well, you know, the, if your dog has tremendous food drive, you could probably get away with that for a long time. Toss a treat in, the dog will run in, and then you could get to a point where the dog is just anticipating. They'll run in even if there isn't food because they're anticipating you're going to throw something in for them. But if they have moderate food drive, you might get away with that once or twice, maybe three times. And then if they don't want to go in the crate, they're not going. Yeah. They just don't care about the food. Well, and there's a behavioral aspect of that, this bribing versus rewarding, right? Like we want the dogs, we want to say crate, and then the dog, it's followed up with food. Even if you're feeding your dogs your meals in the crate, 
you're telling them to do something and then their breakfast or their dinner comes in. It's not that you're, you know, putting that in the back of the crate and that's how they're getting in the crate and they have two feet out the front door while they're eating or, you know, you close it while they're eating. No, they can get a Kong, they can get something in there, but first they should listen to you, choose to go in the crate and then get rewarded. Bribing is not going to get you very far in life. Let's show um, a couple pictures and video um, from this weekend just before we go to break. Chrissy, do whatever order you want. But um, Noel has this great facility, um, the parking lot. It's a place for daycare and training. We did some bite work um, with her dogs there afterward. And we had a good group. It was really a good group. We have a, did I send you a video too? All right, show the video and I'll shut up. <laughs> and like the actual training kind of stuff, loose leash walking will change your life. So um, can you hand me that leash that's behind you on the chair? Uh, there's like one, yeah, right there. Perfect. Thanks. And you did so good, Raven, going back to mommy for meditation. Okay. So, uh, I have, yes? What about the dominant dog collar? That's perfect. I'm not nice about those. I'm really not into... Yeah, so, I mean, we had a great group. We used our dogs for demo dogs. We had to lean pretty heavily on my two girls, actually, because Jimmy, normally, we would really rely on with this, and he was on three legs. He did come in on a bed and, you know, grab his Halloween arm and everything else. But, you know, we were using our dogs as demo dogs. I point to, in that video, loose leash walking, and this is something that I've included in the How to Calm Your Canine seminars. It is not in the actual course, but I do t like to take, you know, 10 to 15 minutes to discuss this because it's another behavioral aspect of anxiety. If your dog is on a leash and, you know, darting behind you because of fear of loud noises or a truck or a mailman or something or dragging you towards other dogs or people or reactive or barking or anything else, getting the dog to have solid loose leash walking changes their mental state maybe more than anything else. So if you do have a dog with, you know, extreme emotional issues, you know, some anxiety, very intense fear, something else, if you do not have loose leash walking, that's an excellent place to start. And I mean, you would agree, we teach every pet dog loose leash oh, walking. Oh yeah, and uh, you know, it's funny with these, with these dogs that have like separation anxiety where they follow you from room to room in the house, you can't shake this dog, you can't get them off your butt, you can turn around falling over them all day long. But if they slip out the front door, they'll take <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah, they're gone. Yeah. Now, but there's no recall there. Yeah. Or the opposite happens where they will drag you on the leash everywhere and just could care less about you. But quite often, if you drop the leash, then they're like, oh, my God, where are you? And they yeah. turn around and come back because they're used to that pulling. And they don't, the way they know you're there is by dragging you behind yeah, them Yeah, that the time, is such you know? a good point that you bring up. You see this very often that a dog's just like on you like white on rice, you know, annoying, annoying, annoying. And then as soon as they get the chance to be loose or, you know, maybe like Scott said, accidentally slip out the front door, then they're gone. Then their anxiety is channeled into, you know, the outer world and everything else. So it manifests itself differently in each dog. But it's important to kind of know what anxiety looks like for your dog and then of course have ways to target it and help it okay let's go to break super quick and when we get back we'll talk a little bit more about how to calm your canine want to keep up with all the latest from the quirky dog podcast like me and murphy here then make sure you head on over to the youtube channel and subscribe or if you prefer to listen to the madness go on over to itunes or spotify and follow the quirky dog podcast and hey while you're there leave a rating and review and let them know what you think of the show until then keep it quirky Another part of this behavioral stuff and, you know, anxiety in dogs and the way it manifests itself is in noise. You're going to get some whining. Maybe you'll get some barking, some protest barking. Maybe you'll get a dog who's super reactive in the car. If you have a noisy dog and you do not have a way to combat that noise and a protocol to work through and a way to start at least getting those, you know, noise levels to decrease over time, you're not going to be helping to get yourself on top of the anxiety either. Quiet dogs are calm dogs. I don't know how else to say that, but it's true. A dog that's barking its head off for no reason or constantly whining when it doesn't get what it wants is not in a, you know, good mental state. They're not in a healthy mental state. So if you have noise issues outside of, okay, I don't have loose leash walking. I could do that. I'm not crating currently. Okay. Maybe I should crate. I haven't done structured feeding before. Maybe I should try that. Get on top of the noise also. These are all quick and easy ways to start to play around with, hey, is my dog getting better? I cannot tell you the lovely feedback we've gotten from this weekend. I could well up, you know, talking about it. And I'm not going to go give a bunch of testimonials, but people have been like, this is so refreshing. My dogs are calmer already. This is, this is amazing. This is so simple. You know, it's it just it really eye-opening. Like some of these little things can make all of the difference. It's just about your mindset changing and, you know, your dog kind of starting to get on the same page as you rather than you just catering to your dog at every turn. Yeah, I think that, you know, a lot of people, they get a lot of information off the internet, YouTube, and a lot of trainers out there that are working 
primarily in a positive way. And the problem is, you know, there are some things that the dog has to do. And we get into animal husbandry, you know, nail trimming and, and bathing and this or that. Just like your child has to go brush their teeth. It's not optional. We would love it if they just wanted to do it because we asked them to. But dogs and kids, they have their own mind. They want to do what they want to do. So there are some things where you don't have to ask them for their consent. You don't need, you know, it's just we need to get this done. And for, for their greater good, yeah, it's, for it's the health for of the health. animal. And, you know, we're really big within this program. Not so much that, you know, a vet can do anything to a dog or a groomer can do anything to a dog or this, that, and the other. But you personally, as the dog's owner, should be able to, if you need to, muzzle, we get it. But you should be able to check its ears, look at its teeth, pull off a tick if need be. Maybe like we take talked about a few months, yeah. a few weeks ago. Yeah, practical things like being able to take the dog's temperature. If you're able to handle your dog, and I get that a lot of people are really um, fearful about, you know, cutting the nails. They don't want to cut the quick and everything. You don't have to do it in a functional set, but you shouldn't be able to go and just tip the dog's nails. If you're able to handle your dog, the anxiety, the problem behaviors, all of this stuff that seems like, you know, so far away, so out of reach. If you're able to physically handle your dog in a safe way or physically present your dog to the vet in a way that will be safe for the vet, maybe the dog is muzzled. Maybe you're having to restrain the dog or hold the dog there for its temperature or a blood draw or whatever else. Things shift dramatically. And as of this year, I would say, yeah, it seems more like a 2023 thing. I would say we've had six to eight dogs, like specifically that come in for training that really can't even be dealt with at the vet in any way, shape or form. Like the story of Sandy touched on that last week with the podcast with Emily, but we've had multiple other dogs, German shepherds, Australian shepherds, dogs that like legitimately are getting hardcore drugs. The vet still cannot handle them. Maybe they're even giving ACE for something. And we're conditioning these dogs to a muzzle. We're teaching these dogs to accept basic handling. And we just got a great report from a previous client with the shepherd. She went to the vet and it, everything went great. I mean, it was she was shocked. Yeah. The dog was muzzled. But pers- honestly, I cut that dog's nails with a muzzle and a cone because the dog fought so hard. And like already with what she's been doing at home and everything else, it's getting so much better. The vet noticed a difference. I mean, dogs need to get vaccines. Dogs need to get their temperatures taken. Sometimes dogs need to get blood drawn to see if there's a bigger underlying cause going on with, you know, some behavioral concern or some physical concern or anything else. This is just basic stuff. So if you're able to do it, I promise you, your relationship, your dog's headspace, everything else will change tenfold because it's really, really important that the dog at least accepts basic care from you, the owner. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest uh, holdups or concerns for many dog owners is when their dog is having fear or they're perceiving that their dog is afraid, they don't want to force something that makes the fear worse. That's the biggest thing, and that's what you'll read and see a lot of on YouTube about if the dog's afraid, stop because it's going too far and you're just gonna make this worse and worse. You need to get the dog to tolerate uh, steps of these issues that are fearful and then get them to realize, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah, we're not saying slap a muzzle on the dog and cut every single nail, you know, on its feet. But we are saying condition the dog to a muzzle in a reasonable time frame, maybe, you know, two to five sessions. We go through muzzle conditioning in our free course, Canine Mind Shift. Then at least be able to pick up the dog's foot. Like legitimately, like the first week you can pick up each foot. The second week, maybe you can cut one nail from each foot. Like you can go in and ease in slowly but the dog does have to tolerate things. That is so important. And we're so quick to, you know, back off with any resistance now. And I personally am seeing it build a lot of dogs up. You know, all these vets, these vet techs, they're backing off. They're, oh, the dog's not ready. They're not giving consent. And now all of a sudden I have a dog that for three years of its life has been like, you're not effing touching me or coming near me. And now I have to be like, no, no, like you need, you need to be able to receive care. And the dogs get to a much better, safer place you know, through training and everything else, but how to calm canine, how to calm your canine does intro a lot of that stuff. And I just cannot emphasize enough how important it is for you as the owner to be able to handle your dog. And uh, I'll be honest right now, Cousteau is getting a little bit snarkier with his nails. You know, I, we, he's muzzled. Scott holds the leash while I do his nails. We have string cheese and he is getting to a point where he's kind of a little bit done with me. Like he'll let me do three and then he'll let out a growl. Like it's escalating. So I'm going to order um, a Dremel. I'm normally not a Dremel person, but I'm going to order a Dremel and I'm going to condition him to a Dremel and I'm going to start doing it nail by nail by nail because 
you know, he's 10 years old. Maybe he has a little arthritis in his toes or anything else, but I still need to be able to cut the dog's nails or, you know, dremel the dog's nails for the next X amount of years. So I'm going to switch up what I'm doing and try to kind of retrain that in a sense as well. And I will say also, I think what's contributing to that is that he is living a much looser lifestyle. Yeah. So when he was working and we were training for sport and competition, he was so dialed in that everything would just kind of fell under the umbrella of another training. obedience exercise. Yeah, I have to hold my paw like yeah. this. Yeah. I got to do that. I, yeah. You know, it's just, just the way life is. But he's older and he gets a lot more leeway. And him, he can't afford to have too much emotional freedom. Yeah. The more freedom that dog has the more bad choices he's going to make. Yeah. And whether it's like, hey, I'm not in the mood for this right now and yeah. get grumbly or yeah. whatever. But and we're recognizing that yeah. in our own household. And Scott's the first one to say, he's like, you yeah, know, I'm going to start taking him for walks in the morning again. I'm going to start, he does actually have to start taking him to work more because Jimmy's not going to be able to go to work for a bit. So all of this little stuff. like and he'll we go, be great. He'll be great Yeah, for that. he does great, but it, it will help his headspace to get out and do some actual work. So while, you know, it seems like, oh, that doesn't matter, we know it matters. We know that if a dog like Cousteau is starting to get less tolerant of his nails being clipped, that's going to start spilling over to other areas of his life. And we want to see those signs early, combat those, and then turn things around. So we have more har harmony in our house. We're big on harmony. I want to give another example of how that, uh, a little bit of obedience in one place helps another place. I went to a client's house once where they had an acre of yard in the back, just a beautiful big fenced acre. So the dog was always in the backyard. They never put a leash on the dog, but they called me because the dog would jump all over everybody in the house. If anyone came to the house, the dog would jump all over them. And I said, okay, um, put a leash on the dog and let's uh, take him out and do some healing. And they said, well, we don't need to do that because we have a big backyard. We never take the dog out on a leash. And I said, I understand, but I'd like to just you know, get a little bit of control so I took the dog out in front. We worked the dog for 15 minutes. We bring the dog back in. The dog won't jump on anybody. <laughs> it had nothing to do with jumping. Yeah. But since we put a little bit of control on the dog's brain, he was better behaved and more thoughtful in the house. So one thing always, you know, things typically bleed into another, whether it's a lack of control bleeding into now your, your grooming. Less control in other places. Or control that now has given you better control in other areas. Yeah. So you need to have that balance for the sake of the dog and the people around, the last thing you want is to either rehome your dog or, God forbid, have to put the dog down. Or even have an incident with animal stupid, control yeah, dog, over a bite. Yeah, you don't want this. The dog never this. bit anybody in its life, and now it bit somebody over something stupid because the dog has the run of the house or the property, and now all of a sudden he thinks... I'm going to control everything in the yeah. world here, you know? We say that all the time. The control you put on the dog outside the house is going to transfer to inside the house, and the control you put on the dog inside the house is going to transfer to outside the house. So, and the funny thing about how to calm your canine, it's not really like this heavy control. And we bring up, you know, positive training versus balance training. How to calm your canines with a flat collar. There's no compulsive tools that are added. There's nothing else. I don't even think I mentioned bark collars in the barking section. I mean, clearly, we're pro that kind of scene if you need to use a bark collar inside of a crate for excessive barking and everything else. But like, it is like as watered down material as possible to appeal to any average pet person, to appeal to any shelter volunteer, to appeal to all camps. Like we're just talking about some basic exercises to try to change your dog to be living in a happier, healthier headspace. I th I'd say it appeals to all dogs too, because yes, there are outliers that need more work. They may need to go with another, other tools. But for the most part, the average, they're domesticated animals. Yeah. You know, they don't want to be uh, crazy. Yeah. They're acting crazy, but they're not comfortable being crazy. Yeah. And so we need to get them reeled in and let them, quite often the dogs just kind of relax. Like, yeah. oh my God, thank you. Finally. Thank <laughs> you for giving me some parameters yeah. to live with it. That feels you good. Know? You can almost feel this like sigh of relief that goes on. And Scott, you know, talked about dogs who bite and you may think, oh, well, my dog's never going to bite. And, you know, maybe that is the case. Maybe that is. But I will tell you, and we say it time and time again, our most aggressive dogs have the highest levels of anxiety, the dogs that we have worked with in the past. So aggression and anxiety are often closely related. Drive and anxiety are often closely related. You guys, these type A personality entrepreneurs that are out there, you know, go, 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 go. They have a ton of drive. 
They also probably have a high level of anxiety. They may have been diagnosed with ADHD. Like all of these things are interrelated. So the more you start seeing this big picture and putting the pieces of the puzzle together, the easier it will be to combat. And I do want to mention like you have to know what anxiety looks like in general in dogs. You know, we went through that at the seminar. I always like to do, you know, like some different like round round table discussions about like what do you see? You know, obviously drooling, panting, barking, excessive water um, intake. That was one that Scott yeah. had brought up. There's a bunch of different things to look for. Shaking. Suck, suckling or yeah. self-mutilation. Self-mutilating. There's a bunch of different things that come up. But also, what does it look like for your dog? Like, what does anxiety look like? When does your dog start getting anxious? Like, for Sink, if she's going to show some anxiety, she'll start, like, scanning the room. You know, if Vital's going to be anxious, she'll start being vocal. She's vocal in a lot of contexts. But, you know, that's maybe a time where she's a little bit looser. She's starting to <laughs> crazy stuff. So you need to not only know what anxiety as an overall big picture looks like in dogs, but what does anxiety look like for your dog? And what are the first signs of anxiety so it doesn't spill over into this full-on drool fest where you have a puddle now in front of your dog while it's, you know, sitting on the floor or in its crate, or it does get to the point where not only it's licking itself silly, but it is self-mutilating. Like you want to head that off on the front end, but you need to know how to identify that and what that actually does appear like in your own home. Oh, I, Scott, I, I normally I normally would pass off. He no, wasn't no, ready. No, no, I, I, I agree. And it's, you know, I mean, we're going to get to the emotional part for the people too, but quite often, and really, it's like, unless you get a really anxious rescue that comes into your house with either this pre you know, this genetic predisposition or whatever the situation, it comes in with extreme anxiety. And there are definitely those dogs that people rescue on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. But other than that, when you get a purebred German Shepherd, or you, you know, most of these purebreds, regardless of their drive and this and that, if they are co a complete mess at a year old, typically that's on you. I, I say that, you know, I, I begrudgingly, I hate to say that because I don't want to throw anybody, anyone under the bus, but it is inadvertently, not intentionally, but the way you're handling that dog and the anxiety that you may be having in your house yes. uh, is bleeding over. If you have a kid that's having problems in school, the whole house is tense and you're, you got stress about that. The dog's picking up on all that stuff. The yeah. dog's getting more anxious. When, when that kid gets home, the dog may get more anxious because they know you're going to start yelling at that kid or <laughs> who knows what. Or you're just going to get stressed because that yeah. kid got off the school bus. And that's a good place. A stopping point here. Like, what do you do if you're anxious yourself? And I am the first one, like... I full on, I'm having hives right now. My acid reflux is back. I've had crazy insomnia. Like, and on the other hand, uh, yeah. I'm sleeping like Scott's a baby. Scott's perfect, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons why Scott's life is great. But this is all in response. She makes response. my life great. This is all, thank you. This is all in response to Jimmy, like, you know, having a pretty intense surgery next week. I really would prefer him not to be going under at 11 years old. A lot of old. financial stress yeah, associated with that. Yeah, there's a lot that. of financial stress that goes with that. It's three full months now of rehab. Like, I mean, he's ready to, like, rock and roll. He's the like, travel. I want to go to work. Like, I got... You know, three legs. I can do it. Let me go. Yeah. I Anticipating this weekend that we're, we just did, we had to rent a vehicle, drive six dogs to New York. Yeah, so it's There's not that going on. we're exempt from anxiety. Scott's batty too. I got in the freaking cold water this morning. Like, I mean, we, we have emotional issues ourselves. We're not up here preaching from some like higher than now like standpoint. But when you have your own emotional issues, it's important to recognize them, have ways to combat them. We've talked about EFT before. We do cold plunges. We've talked about meditation. We meditated at this seminar. We did a minute meditation, a full nice. day group. Like nice. we, you know, we put on some background music and stuff. But I mean, we practice what we preach, you guys. We meditate with dogs every month. We put it up on the Canine Healing Facebook page. I've said time and time again, one of my favorite parts of Canine Healing is on the Instagram page, Scott's literally meditating with Cousteau for 30 minutes a day for like 10 days straight. I sped it up. It's not a full thing. But like we do do these things, you know, and it is important to start to tap into that. And when we're meditating, it doesn't mean that we're levitating up towards, you know, the heavens and everything's feeling great. But we're trying to get control of our thoughts. We're trying to focus on our breath. Things that tap into the emotional part of how to calm your canine are things like meditating. They are things like journaling, 
Sometimes if you're really stressed, just write it in a freaking notebook. You can throw it out, throw it in the fire and burn it later that night, but get it out. You need to get these emotions out of you. You know what I mean? So if you are a person that's like, well, I'm way too batty and I'm making my dog batty. Well, maybe that's the case or maybe, you know, it's a combo of everything else, but there are ways to get on top of that. And the better control you have of the dog, the better you're going to feel about yourself and the better that you're able to regulate your own emotions and know your own triggers and start working through these triggers, the better you guys. If I haven't mentioned it before, if you don't follow the holistic psychologist on Instagram, it's the best account out there. And there's a lot of good there too. Yeah. But I will say that, you know, pain has always been the motivator for me to improve myself. And uh, I know it is with Jess too. We just doesn't want to settle for anything less than the best possible life that she can live. And for me, that's kind of a high standard. I just don't want to kill myself. <laughs> so, you know, we're all coming from different places. But, you know, I quit drinking 30 plus years ago because it was just, I was just spiraling into a, into a homeless situation. And um, I That can, was his first pain point. His pain I, got yeah, hard enough that he made a, a choice to change. It's a pain point. And yeah. it's the same thing with these dogs. People that came to the seminar, they all had pain points. They yeah. didn't come there. I don't think maybe there was a few that were just curious. But for the most part, there's people coming that have pain points that have to do with their dog. And they're ready to make a change. Yeah, and they they're want looking something for to information to make a change. And we're so grateful to that community and that audience because they were engaged. They were ready. They were ready to take the next step. So if you're ready to take the next step, we've said a lot of stuff here today for free. You don't have to go spend under $40 to buy the online course that's in the description. But there are ways to start. And, you know, change starts from within. So just think about these little things. We're not trying to point fingers or judge or anything else. But we have felt a lot better through a lot of these practices we've done. And we see our clients feeling a lot better, not only through these types of practices that we bring up and how to calm your canine, but also for getting on top of their dog's issues. All right. I do want to say Halloween is coming up. I have this super cute Barbie costume at home, but I couldn't find the fur thing for Ken to ship soon enough. So I don't even know if we're even dressing up this year. And listen, year. Jess wants me to carve out a pumpkin so we can <laughs> stick it on top of her dog's head. Yeah, we'll head. do that. There is a previous Halloween episode <laughs> linked in the description, though, guys, if you want tips. Thank you so much to the people at the Barking Lot. We had a great, great time. Thank you, Noel Aska. Thank you to our audience for joining us yeah, here today. It was great to meet all you guys. And in the meantime, keep, keep it, it quirky. Bye, guys. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.